Hi, um, apologies I can't be there today, but today we're going to talk about differential privacy in comps and function market makers. This is joint work between myself, uh, Alex Evans, and Guillermo Andres. So, you know, first, uh, let's kind of start with the history and sort of being able to define what uh, automated market, these types of automated market makers are before we start talking about notions of privacy. Often, we need a way of trading assets. Uh, you know, normally it's just relatively easy. You have people who want to buy an asset posting bids, which is the maximum price they're willing to buy for. You have people who are selling posting asks, which is the minimum price they're willing to sell at. And a trade occurs when someone is willing to bid at a price higher than the lowest ask. But there are a lot of disadvantages with this. Uh, first off, a trusted party has to store uh, the keep a record of all outstanding bids and asks. There's, so there's a linear space requirement, linear in the number of uh, traders and trades made. Um, when the highest bid is more than the last asker, this, this actually has this problem where the price may update slowly um, as the bid ask spread isn't crossed enough, especially when there's a small market, smaller number of agents. And usually exchanges have to add subsidies to ensure there's liquidity. So one question is, could we replace these market makers with automated market makers that sort of given liquidity can automatically price things without needing the notion of a human uh, providing bids and asks. And so you can, and one thing you may want is you want some uh, desired qualities like bounded loss. You can bound the worst case loss that uh, the market maker takes. Um, liquidity sensitivity, if there's a lot of liquidity, the price shouldn't move too much. If there isn't much, uh, then the price does not move that much. And the small storage requirements, so reducing the amount of storage from linear to, to constant. So this idea was sort of really invented in the 1970s uh, with Savage, sort of taking statistical scoring rules and trying to make market scoring rules out of them, um, popularized by Robin Hanson in 2002. And the idea is you use a simple formula to determine asset prices as a function of liquidity, which is sort of a, not a quantity of assets locked into a contract. So liquidity providers pool their assets, say assets A and asset B, into reserves. If the price is too low, agents can purchase uh, assets from the market maker and then sell externally if there's another market. And if the price is too high, agents can buy from an external market and sell back to the market, market maker. So in this way, we sort of have price synchronization amongst market. And you can basically say, I want to set the price of the asset based on the amount of reserves that are left in the market maker. So if one asset is significantly less present, so there's a lot less of it, then it should be worth more, just sort of natural supply and demand. Two very simple examples, uh, which are sort of ex different examples that you should keep in your mind while thinking about this. Um, one is a flat line, which sort of has a fixed asset price at all reserve quantities. So it just says there's asset A and asset B, there's a fixed ratio at which you can buy them, um, and that price is kept constant the whole time. On the other hand, another one is something where the reported price is the ratio of the two asset prices. So the idea being that um, the asset that's more scarce will sort of be uh, worth more in when you use when you use the ratio. And this curve is known as Uniswap, which is sort of the largest and most popular automated market maker right now. So this type of market maker is, is called a CFMM, Compton Function Market Maker. And one natural question is, of course, how do you define it? So a content function market maker, the contract with a reserve with reserves of coins, say coins A1 through AN, and the reserves of each coin are denoted RI. Liquidity providers supply these reserves. So they 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 basically take a portfolio of those assets and they lock it into a contract. And traders are allowed to add and remove coins A and B, or really A1 through AN provided that they keep an invariant function constant. So a constant of the reserves that are in the contract. And this 
this function turns out to have to be concave and non-increasing uh, for sort of no arbitrage properties. Um, this is from previous work of ours, but um, for, for simplicity, we can, we can kind of assume that for this talk. And the idea is that the epigraph, which you can think of as the super level set um, uh, of the function, uh, is, 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 is called the trading set, which is a set of feasible or allowable trades. We'll, we'll look at how, what that looks like in a second. And the most popular example is the constant product, which is just simply making phi and holding the product of all the reserves constant. So first off, you might say this is a theoretical construct. How do I know it's real? Well, this data already shows that there's sort of billions of dollars of, of volume on these that these exchanges right now. So let's look at what the trading set looks like. For the constant product, so in this case, RA times RB equals constant, we get this hyperbola. And the trading set, the epigraph is all the points above. And all the points on the lot, on the kind of boundary are, are, are also feasible trades. Um, all the points that are feasible trades that preserve that the product constant um, are also feasible above um, but the ones below are not, which is why it's okay that we still added them. Um, there may not, there may, if someone makes one of those trades, however, there may be an arbitrage um, where sort of trades on the line are not arbitrageable. But like I said, no rational trader will ever pick a point inside because they will immediately be arbed and, and take a loss almost instantly. And so, this is what the trading set looks like, but you might say, oh, okay, why, why is there this ARB loss? How does the, the market maker quote a price? Well, what's important to note is that the slope of the tangent line at each point effectively corresponds to price. It corresponds to a notion of how much, how scarce uh, the asset is when I move in the direction of trading it in that asset. So if I add more of an asset, then I'm making it less scarce. And so the price should go down. If I'm uh, removing an asset, uh, I'm making it more scarce and its price should go up, relatively speaking. A natural question you may ask after thinking about the fact that the prices are the slopes of these tangent lines is why do we need convexity? Well, if you don't have convexity, you effectively will run into this sort of separating hyperplane. Uh, where you'll have two points that have exactly the same price. And there's basically no reason why not to fill them in um, because you basically would argue that any, if you don't fill those in, you're creating free arbitrage. And the only way to get to be arbitrage free is to basically along this line, quote the same price between the two dots, which is the slope of that line. So one question, natural question, Next is how do we actually classify how these market makers behave as a function of the, these, these curves V? And we do that by looking at what's known as the curvature. The curvature, given that these functions are defined by implicit functions, phi of arguments equals constant, ends up being an implicit function, which is a ratio of derivatives. Uh, and we argue that the, if we can find upper bound, uniform upper bounds and lower bounds on how much this function changes, then we effectively can give an idea of how much of a price impact do you have. So uh, this notion of price impact sort of says, how fast does the slope of the line change as I move a little bit within a neighborhood of a point? And if I can bound how much that changes, both above and below, then I can say the minimum amount of price impact from the lower bound and the maximum amount from the upper bound. So without going into detail, I think it's just easier to see in pictures. So um, in the first case, in the upper left corner, we have two automated market makers. One is called Uniswap, one is Balancer. Balancer has higher curvature. As you can see, its slope of the curve changes faster. And we consider an initial state where um, Balancer's price is quoted as higher than Uniswap's. And we assume they're the same assets. So someone arbitrages the two. Um, and after the arbitrage, uh, you see that the Uniswap price has changed a smaller amount than the balancer price. So the rate of change uh, of the slope of these lines, which is measured by the dashed line, is lower. 
which says that Uniswap has lower curvature. On the other hand, another popular automated market maker is called Curve. It's very flat. It's meant to trade assets that are, tend to be mean reverting and very similar to each other in price. And you, we see kind of the same thing where the Uniswap slope, the dashed blue line, moves more than the slope of the dashed green line, which means that the that curve has less curvature. So one natural question is, do we actually have privacy in these systems? Um, perhaps, you know, we do a zero knowledge proof commitment of reserves and then no one can see the quoted price. The problem is the convexity of the trading set in fact means that we only need to see the price changes and the initial reserves to recover the exact sequence of trades, which uh, it says that effectively the convexity of this protocol, which effectively makes it easy to trade against, also reduces privacy because I mean you can invert uh, the exact trades from the prices. There are only really two ways to avoid this. One is batching, so batching many transactions together so that it's hard to tell which one was which. Uh, but this has worse price impact. So if I'm a small trade and I get batched with a really large trade and there's a large amount of curvature, then I will pay more. Uh, and it's sort of worse UX. You may have to wait until there are enough trades for a batch to show up. So the latency is worse or at least more variable at the very least. And the, another way you can do it is randomizing prices. So adding or removing a little bit to each order, but that changes the price impact. So another thing is randomizing prices isn't so easy. Suppose that we just added IID random prices to the to each, IID random noise to each price. Well, if there's a central limit there, an adversary can, can denoise and learn PI. Uh, and so we've sort of we've kind of made it not as good as we had hoped. Okay, so now let's talk about adversaries and central pricing. So any mechanism has to make this trade off between price impact, as we saw just now, and privacy. And price impact is the excess cost users pay if uh, effectively for for uh, versus a, a completely non-private mechanism. Uh, and privacy in a lot, another way is sort of the number of bits an adversary represented by this school can estimate uh, of delta i, my trade. Batching is really good for privacy, but bad for price impact. So just as an example, the worst case is suppose I have t trades um, where t minus one of the trades are size one, and one trade is of size t. Um, if the CFMM's curvature is bounded by cap below by kappa, so that means it moves the price at least kappa times the trade size, then the worst case price impact is linear in the number of trades, which is bad. The, the, the trade size one previously would have had price impact const that was constant in trade size, but that's not true here. So in this case, you can see CFMM evaluation, bad for privacy, good for price impact. And so one question is if we can go between these two extremes, just the raw CFMM evaluation and batching, perhaps we can get a good trade-off between privacy and utility. So our model of an adversary is the adversary knows the initial reserves of the CFMM at time t. They also know the marginal price, so that's the, the slope of the line at the current reserves. And they can take a trade and determine whether it's valid. Um, so they can, these are the queries they're allowed to do. Um, and we explicitly assume that they don't know directly identifying information, which could be hidden by zero knowledge proof ones. So one question you may say is like, let's suppose we're, we're the adversary. Well, how would we learn this? So you may say, okay, let's think about online learning, like online learning algorithms where I see a sequence of trades and I try to guess the identity of the trade. We can represent this by an adversary who's adaptive, who's learning T Boolean functions for a trade of trade size, size T, where the trade is size one, if it's the whale, the large the trade of size T. And you can kind of use classical boosting bounds to show that the, you know, if the adversary can construct these functions that may be weak learners, they just strictly have to have some probability greater than one half of being correct. Um, 
they, the adversary can learn the trade with probability arbitrarily close to one. Uh, and in, in particular, control of how the price, the noise added to the price affects the adversary's probability of being correct is actually very important uh, to understanding how these algorithms work. So one important thing to note, studying the set of sort of online learning adversary strategies is very hard. Uh, it's a high dimensional space, potentially infinite dimensional, depending on how you parameterize it. Um, and it depends on the particular instance and the particular binary, binary class. Rates. But we really, really want minimax bounds over all trade sequences. So there's a bunch of recent results that show that online learning algorithms are sort of dual in a certain sense to differential privacy algorithms. And that effectively says our uh, trades and identities of traders are hard to learn online if we can actually prove differential privacy guarantees. So our goal is to prove differential privacy guarantees to make it hard for an adversary to online learn the identity or sizes of trades. What is differential privacy? So the idea with differential privacy is I take two data sets, I remove one of the data points or I add noise one of the data points and the attacker is asked the query of, can I determine which point was removed even though I get sort of effectively the same answer in the output. Um, another way of thinking about it is if I have two input data points, I have an algorithm A and I have two input data points X and X prime, um, it, which are very close in, uh, in distance. Um, if I, even, even though they're close in distance, I can't really identify that they're the same up to an error that's multiplicatively, multiplicatively bounded by epsilon and additively by delta. And this picture kind of shows um, what this looks like, uh, sort of like how the probability distribution of such things look like. Cool. So without diving more into different privacy, I think we're just going to go straight to the results. Um, so please see the paper for more on, on different privacy. Informally, we show that if uh, phi is a kappa liquid and a mu stable CFMM trading function for uh, processing a sequence of trades, and if we have a verifiable source of randomness, so a verifiable random function that we can use, we can achieve mu log n the low of one differential privacy. And we basically need three types of probability distributions to sample from, for, from the VRF. We need to sample a Laplace distribution that is a function of the trades um, and Laplace distributions are oftentimes used in differential privacy. We need a sample of uh, random permutation from the uniform distribution or a symmetric group, sigma. And then we need to sample a random probability distribution, uh, pi, um, from the Dirichlet distribution. So without going into a super amount of detail, uh, I think we're just gonna, I'm just gonna try to provide some intuition. The main thing we do is we construct a combinatorial object which we call the trade tree, which is con constructed from partial sums of trades. So what we do is we, uh, we randomly permute the trades, that's delta of sigma of j. And then for each uh, element of permutation, we look at how much it differs from the ratio of the max price change given that trade at, to the lowest price change given that trade, that's the mu over kappa delta j. And so this sort of measures how much after, we, after randomly permuting the trades, which, which we use the VRF to do, uh, how much of a deviation we see in the sequence of trades. So you could think of this as like, if I have an online learner, as they're trying to learn this sequentially, they're getting this sort of partial sum of trades. And if this partial sum has a lot of noise, then it effectively lowers their ability to, to learn this. And the tree we construct, which is effectively a binary heap generated by the sequence of partial sums, captures how much noise there is. And so for instance, in this sort of balanced tree example, this is something that has height log n, uh, where n is the number of trades. Um, <clears throat> you can basically see that we get, we sort of get this, this nice tree. And you know, we go for, if we if we look at it, we have like one is the root, two is right, three is left, four is right. 
five is back up, go to the other side of the tree, six is go to the other child of the same parent, seven is down, eight goes across. And so by being noisy, this is effectively what I mean by being noisy is that the, the partial sums are sort of moving throughout this heap and that's sort of captured by the height of this tree. So what we show is that the maximum price deviation between the permuted price and the original price, right? Remember, this is sort of the price impact of randomizing the order is bounded effectively by the height of this tree. Uh, and if the height of the tree, if it's a random tree, is log n, which you, you know we can show using classical results, probability results, uh, then we basically argue that by randomly permuting the orders, we have sort of lowered the probability of an adversary being able to figure out the identity, but we've also only caused O of log n, where n's the number of trades, uh, price impact. Whereas before we, we showed the worst case in the whale example was causing O of n, uh, omega of n impact. So this says that randomly permuting orders, provided they meet some constraints, um, actually, kind of doesn't impact the price too much. And then we also kind of can use that to, to get differential privacy results. Um, so how do we ensure that we have log n height? Well, the first thing is we need the trades to be sort of uniformly distributed when they're permuted in the sense that, that you know, when I have the trades one, 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 regardless of what permutation I apply, uh, I get basically the same set of trades. So there's no, there's no kind of identifiability. There's sort of no entropy there. So what we do is we add noise to the trade so that the probability that they're the same, that these elements of the partial sum are the same is low. And then the other thing we do is we split very big trades. Um, so like in the whales, in the case of like the trades one, 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 100, we split up the 100 randomly and that's what the Dirichlet distribution is for. And it turns out that by uh, splitting up big trades, you actually lower the variance uh, you increase the variance of, of uh, the adversary's learning algorithm. So you can combine all these operations using composition rules of differential privacy uh, and show that we get this as differentially private. Um, so one question you might ask is, can we do better than this O of log n impact um, using sort of this differential privacy online learning correspondence? we show that the little stone dimension of the, this uh, process is, is lower bounded and the little stone dimension sort of controls both online learnability and how easy it is to make an algorithm private. Um, and one other question is how do we handle fees? Uh, and so we provide some insight in the appendix and how to do that. Uh, it's quite a bit harder. Um, as we believe you need sort of chaining style arguments, um, but I, th I believe that it can be done. You can bootstrap from these results. So CFMMs are a very powerful, highly used form of on-chain trading that can be made differentially private. Uh, they require verifiable randomness if we want to really provide some application privacy. So one question is, you know, can we improve the constants in these proofs? Um, you know, how optimal is this sort of numerically? Can we actually like reduce the amount of entropy needed uh, from sampled from the verifiable random function? And, you know, what is the relationship of this with minor extractable value? Which is sort of something that is plaguing uh, blockchains right now. Great, now open up for questions.